The heartland of America, known to many as the breadbasket of the world, home to pioneers who braved the elements to lay down roots in a fertile soil, home to spiritual folks who lived good, clean lives, home to a hard work ethic and democratic conservatism that has been the ideological compass of the world for the last 200 years. But somewhere along the line, cracks began to form in some of America's most vital institutions. Work, community, family, all suddenly became susceptible to infection. And the infection came not as some biological plague, but as a deceivingly simple party drug that could be made with ingredients found at any discount department store in America, manifesting itself as a demon epidemic, creating a social infection that has spread to every facet of society and reducing this once great country to a nation of addicts. Welcome to Meth America. methamphetamine abuse has become almost commonplace. When I ask if the problem continues, the response is almost always, of course, as if the question is a little bit naive. We have some idea when kids, and they are kids, first try to I believe that there is a more serious problem in rural America today than there has been in previous years ever. Meth production and use disproportionately affect rural areas. Meth is often called the poor man's cocaine because it is most widely used in blue collar communities, rural areas, and small to mid sized cities. Meth has spread like wildfire across the United States. It has burned out communities, scorched childhoods, and charred once happy and productive lives. They've witnessed destroyed relationships and families torn apart, all suffering from this drug that invades neighborhoods, families, and friends. I personally was born and raised on a farm three miles east of town. In those days, we didn't have electricity or running water or anything like that. And we made our living off the farm. We have a lot of relation around this area, and they were all farmers. You know, it was just kind of a, a place where kids could run wild, and they didn't really have to worry about, you know, a whole heck of a lot. When we were kids, we didn't really realize, I guess, all the things that we could have done. But what you did, you did everything for the family. I mean, everybody worked for the betterment of the family. And that's what you had to do or you didn't survive. Founded in 1840 by Mormons who were soon then run out of town for their alternative beliefs, Glenwood, Iowa, like so many villages found along the Mormon trail, was cast from a crucible that married the more brutal elements of the Bible to a steadfast work ethic tied to the volatile land. This ideology would bring great success to places like Glenwood that rejuvenated themselves generation after generation by creating a heritage that glorified its successes and ignored its failures. I was working at the insurance office in Glenwood and some guy called there one day. And this was like in 1994. He actually threatened that this was gonna happen. He's like, well, I want to get a house out in the country. And he started telling me why. I mean, he obviously was on drugs. He's like, we're going to bring things to your town that you never knew about before. When you see, you see communities devastated, uh, like I've seen, uh, generations of families ruined, uh, unemployment rampant, uh, in some of these smaller communities, and you talk about the effects of meth. I mean, it is like, uh, it, I, I've said on numerous occasions, if you could liken anything to a weapon of mass destruction and its effect on a community, it'd be methamphetamine. 
it's not like the drugs of the 80s or even the early 90s when it was those people that did the drugs. It, it wasn't my family. My family does go to church on Sunday and my family does work all week and go to school regularly. Now we're talking about the cheerleader and we're talking about the housewife who is a member of the PTO. And so that is why we don't want to recognize this as a problem because our upstanding citizens are becoming addicted to methamphetamine. Gosh, these are safe communities. How can something so, so, you know, dangerous to our lifestyle just all of a sudden be so available to everybody? To see somebody go, they don't have a job anymore. They, they, they lost 20 pounds. I mean, to see that happen. And then all of a sudden it happens to somebody else. And then it happens to somebody else. And then it's your mom. It really seemed like she just had, had a glow. The Kaimans in this town are pretty big people. They've been here a long time, and I worked for them when I was a kid. And he'd always pull me aside and said, you know, Brian, when your mom was your age, or when your mom came to this town, she was the prettiest girl anyone had ever seen. We went to go see Brian's mom at the halfway house she was living in since her last brush with homelessness. Brian was nervous because he wasn't entirely sure what kind of condition we were going to find her in. How did meth get into your life? A friend. <laughs> yeah. I was working a waitress job in town, and I was like, it was driving me crazy, and I hated it. And uh, so when I was like, I can't do this, I need, I need some energy. So she brought me son down to the restaurant and did a line in the bathroom and <laughs> and all of a sudden I had a lot of energy. I went was gonna go to a movie one night with my friend and I never went back home. I was blindsided. It wasn't even like there were any events leading up to it. She jumped off the cliff with no safety net. I, I found out where she was, you know, that first time. Oh, and so I went in to confront her and I took two of my best friends with me because I was scared to go alone. And, and I just had my blinders on and walked in. I'm like, where's my mom? And I didn't even really see what was going on around me. But, you know, my friends later were telling me, you know, the group of guys that were sitting around the table in the kitchen were smoking out of a pipe that looked like a pipe that would, you know, be used for pot, but it didn't smell like pot in there. Probably 10 or 15 people in this tiny, tiny, tiny house just doing it. And I am so mad that you guys didn't drag me out of there. I mean, I'd give anything we now. I know, no, I'm just saying, sir, no, I'm just saying, I, <laughs> I know, I wish that day though that, you know, if you could, if it could all go back to somewhere that you could have, could have gotten me out of there, but you would have had to been bodily dragging me because I wasn't going to go. And I wasn't around and it just killed me that I wasn't here to, to say I mean, that. I don't know this if you guys would have stood up to me enough to do that. I oh, stood definitely. up to you. Well, I know, but you didn't drag me out of there. And I just, you know, tried to say things to her that I knew would just stab into her heart and just pull her out, you know, like to get her attention so much that she'd wake up and say, oh my gosh, you're right, what am I doing? The worst part about it was there was my poor sister and this happened to my mom and I, because of money and because of everything in the world, I couldn't even, I couldn't even drive up there to, to help. I couldn't do anything, what do you do? Were you yeah. conscious of the fact that you were giving up your life for this drug? Yeah. Yeah, were you? <laughs> yeah. Do you see a turning point with your mom? I don't know. I mean, they say that you've got to hit total and complete rock bottom. I don't think she's hit that. I wanted her to hit that. I don't, I don't think she's done. I don't think she's done with it. I don't, I think if she is sober right now and not using, it won't last long. I mean, honestly, that's what I feel in my heart. Do you think that she's still doing drugs? I don't know. It's hard not to think that. Because I've never met anybody that did math like that that stopped doing it. And in fact, 
Rhonda later admitted to us that she was high on methamphetamine during this interview. As bad as this is gonna sound, there was a time that I did wish she would die. I just was so done and so helpless and I didn't know what to do anymore and I honestly felt, God, how much better would my life be if she was just gone? That is horrible to say. But when somebody hurts you that bad, just over and over again, it just doesn't even care. You see, she doesn't even care how bad she's hurt me. She's just like, oh, we're fine now. And we're not. I mean, we're not gonna be. I mean, we'll never be the same, ever. It's so weird to know somebody your whole life and then talk to them and not have absolutely any idea who they are. All she talked about every single day incessantly to the point of I had to tell her that I didn't want to hear it again when I lived with her. Oh, those people stole everything from her, what they took from her. And I looked, I just wanted to say, look, look what you took from us. Look what you took from us and you're bitching about them taking it from you. At least you're the one that did it to yourself. You know, you did it to yourself. What you did to us, we don't have any control over. We love you, you know? What did she take? She took my mom from me. The kids are in a crisis right now. If I'm a mom, and I'm a single mom, and I'm sleeping for five days, where are my children? Um, how are they getting fed? How are they getting to school? 26% of the children today come from traditional mom and dad families where mom stays home and dad works. Leave it to beaver families, only 26%. A nuclear family is not, is not exploding, it exploded quite a few years ago. It was clear that Rhonda had put her family through hell. Luckily, Brian and Sarah were old enough to cope with the situation. But what if it would have happened 25 years before, when Brian and Sarah were kids? Who would have taken care of Rhonda then? But more importantly, who would have taken care of the kids? In my uh, six years as a commander of a drug task force, um, it took about actually two years to recognize that we missed the children as being victims of any kind of physical abuse, neglect, psychological, emotional abuse. I couldn't even imagine the kid living like this. They're usually filthy. There's no food in the house. Uh, we did a house uh, here a few years back. We did an active lab in it. The, the woman was pregnant, several months pregnant. She was big. No, she was on dope, yeah. The baby come out positive. Um, and I believe there was another kid living in the house. Well, right in the refrigerator where the food is, is these stripped lithium batteries in a petroleum sitting down there, and it's sitting right in there with the food. Soda bottles always look appealing to kids, except when they contain ether, calm, and fuel. Um, now this would be something that a meth cook would keep in their refrigerator to save for a long period of time. But if they have a five-year-old living in that house, this looks real appealing to a five-year-old. This is a Dr. Pepper. This is something that's fun to drink. Um, they do drink it, and they do suffer severe burns in their esophagus and around their mouth as well. We have seen that here in our hospitals. The most recent report from our local hospital, there's usually between 20 to 30 cases of child abuse and neglect seen in their emergency room per month. We're a small community. How can up to 30 children a month be abused in our community and we don't know about it? Right down there, I, I don't know if you can see, this is private property at the garage, the gray house. Uh -huh. There was a meth lab in that house there, right across the street from the same damn school that my kids go to. Unbelievable. 
when we went into a home where all of the detectives that I was working with were suited up in self-contained breathing apparatus because the the environment was so dangerous mm -hmm. and they carried out a 14 month old child and it spoke volumes. I mean, you have detectives and self-contained breathing apparatus and a child in a diaper. Now, another commonplace thing is to see two year olds completely alone. There was a, a story of a guy we arrested. He was selling drugs to an informant of ours and we have him on the wire and he's, and he's, you know, hurry up, you know, I need to sell this crank to you. You know, which is what the street term for, for meth is crank. But I need to sell you this crank because the, uh, the school's up my ass because I'm never there to pick my kid up on time. And he says, what are you gonna do? Pick your kid up on time or sell dope? It's not a real hard decision. And we arrest him and I ask him where his kid is. And he said, if he hasn't walked home, he's probably still at the school. By the way, his kid's in kindergarten. We go to his trailer where he lives because we're taking the kid into protective custody. And the only toy this kid had was a hockey puck that he got when he went to a hockey game with his class. And I asked the kid, he's six. I said, you had a pretty you know, rough go of it up to this point, huh, partner? And you know, you think the kid was 25? He said, yeah, I, I have, you know, but it's gotta get easier. And the kid's six years old. And his only concern was whether or not he's going to get to go trick or treating. And I told him, you know, I don't care if I got to come get you myself out of the shelter, you're going trick or treat. But you don't do that a lot. You can't save the world. You just try and save the ones you can. But I felt sick to my stomach over this kid. And you know, in a perfect world, you, you know, you could go back and kick the shit out of that guy for that, but you can't. These children are trying to survive. He knows he's not going to wake his mom up because she's high on methamphetamine and she's at her crash, so she's sleeping. So independently, he's going to try to figure out how to catch a bus to go to school. And within that same hour interview with him, he can't count to seven, but he draws an entire meth lab. Um, methamphetamine parents do not parent. Uh, they are annoyed by parenting. Parenting is very hard work and intensive. And meth addicts focus on their addiction, not their children. The conditions that the kids live in is just, it's atrocious. That's probably one of the scariest things about this dope is, you know, you get, I got three kids. That's my only advantage is they get to see what I do. They get to hear me talk about the people. That's my only advantage to just the normal factory worker, because hopefully that will be enough for my kids to stay away from. I think that's what everybody always assumes. There's a lot of kids that, you know, the parents aren't around, and so they're able to do this. Um, you know, I think some of the some of the symptoms of, of meth, you know, you're staying up later, you're angry and agitated. Those are things that teenagers are. The first time I tried meth, I was 14 years old. You'd take a light bulb down, and that's what you'd smoke it in. You'd break out the middle of it, and you'd, you'd put tweak in there, and you'd smoke it four or five o'clock in the morning on a school night. Meth is a brilliant killer. Um, it comes in without being seen, without being noticed, and by the time mom and dad notices Johnny is a meth addict, he's addicted, and he's gone. I didn't realize exactly what meth was. This wasn't just a, a pet pill. You know, this was this was a very dangerous drug. You know, you just get into it, and it, it's it was just something fun you do. You know, you did it on the weekends, and you know, then the next week some kids would get up on and they'd be doing it on Sunday night and come to school on Monday morning like that. Um, and then the next week after that, they didn't come to school. And this is a three-week time period. I remember I had one good friend specifically. Chad was the best skateboarder I ever knew. Everybody loved Chad. He was just a fun guy to hang out with when, you know, he he had meth. It it amplified all those, you know, all that all that, you know, energy that he had and all that passion that he had for things. Um, he went out to the river. Um, you know, we that's kind of the place where people party and this this railroad bridge was something we'd all been on 
It's not exact. It wasn't exactly easy to walk on this bridge, so no, it's dangerous. No, yeah, and that, I mean, like I said, that's kind of the way we were. You know, if there was something dangerous to do, we were gonna do it, and that's you know that's one of the reasons we got into drugs because that was that was dangerous. He he jumped off the bridge because he was trying to swim. He was trying to do something crazy. He said, "Watch this." I was, you know, doing smoking weed and drinking a lot, and those are gateway drugs because I couldn't get that high. I couldn't get higher than what they would give me. So I was like, okay, I'll try it. Me and my best friend, you know, it was it was really, really a sick situation. Um, and uh, I don't know, it was just really, it started something. It's happened so quickly and hit so hard. You know, I'm, I'm surprised that people aren't, you know, taking this as an assault on, you know, American values, you know, the fact that that, that that this drug can come in and, and kind of, you know, give a bad name to, you know, the core of our American myth. You have some idea when kids, and they are kids, first try drugs. I believe that there is a more serious problem in rural America today than there has been in previous years ever. Meth production and use disproportionately affect rural areas. I can honestly say that I have never heard a negative word about Nebraska. They lay it on the Kansas or Iowa as being country X. Lou Hunter is a successful Hollywood writer who thought he was going to retire from the fast pace of LA to the simple life of his hometown of Superior, Nebraska. He instead found himself called to action to try and save the community he has always called home from self-destruction. The reason I moved back to Nebraska was for the so-called values that we talk about that are here to a degree, but, the, but they are uh, being eroded to a, an equally significant degree. I went to the Elks, the Kiwanis, and all the various service clubs. I went to the city, uh, to the, all the chamber of commerces and the city councils around Superior and the area. When I was pulling together 700 people, and I said, we don't want your money, we want your support. I said, I don't have to tell any of you what the problem is that I'm here about. You know, you know some of your friends that you've loved since you were in, in the sandbox have been devastated, to use your word, by drugs. And of course, the most dangerous of all, and the most horrible and one of all is meth. And I said, I want to tell you, you come from a culture that you, not only do you, you know about it, but you should be doing something about it. It would seem ironic then that Lou would be faced with the grandparents' ultimate nightmare, the succumbing of his granddaughter to the very demon drug he'd been working so hard to destroy. When I came to Superior, I was actually literally going through withdrawals. I told one or two people about it that I thought were friends and then kind of got it spread. So then everyone assumed that I was a big drug addict and to stay away from me. And she was mouthing off at certain people that she didn't care for. I say, you never do that here. You never, never do that here, because you never know when you might need them or they might need you. Like Superior and so many rural communities, Glenwood too was in denial. I worked at the city then, you know, and I, I was high profile there, you know, and you know, people know my past. Um, the last time I saw Chad, right next to City Hall. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at work, I'm in the city truck, and if somebody saw me talking to a friend that I used to use with, they may, you know, yeah, they'll talk, you know? And so I, you know, I just drove by and waved at him, and that was the last time I saw Chad. And it was really tough for me that I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk to him before he died because I was nervous about the perception. The last time I ever used, um, October 22nd, um, three months ago, the next day, uh, I attempted suicide. I thought I was going to be addicted to it again. I kept thinking, oh, if it's meth, then I know I'm going to get back into it. And I would lose everybody. And a woman that she's worked in that system for the last 30 years. And she said, I, I tell you, Lou, that She is, in, she is good hands, she is in God's hands. She said, I want you to know that even if she winds up in Geneva, which is the girl's reformatory, God is in Geneva, God is in the center of the world. 
God will take care of her. I can see why people relapse, I think, maybe, because it's like, oh my God, what have I done? I don't want to live with this, so you just would go back to it. Things just got progressively worse. She had called one day and said, she was very panicked, and she said, if you don't hear from me in a half an hour, I need you to call the police and have them sent to the house. And so my mom ended up showing up at my house that night and I let her stay the night, but I just, I was not happy with that situation. I was not comfortable with her being in the house. The next day, I went to the drugstore and I purchased a in-home drug test for methamphetamines. She took the test and it came up positive. You know, told her she needed to pack up her things and leave. And she did. Has the town really tried to reach out and help these people? No, I think it's, it's more of, Oh my God, you know, don't give us a bad name. You know what I mean? It's, it's not a, a, you know, they reach out and say, hey, how can we fix this? Or what's going on? What can we do? Can we start an AA group or a meth group? I don't know what we're going to get from the churches. It doesn't look like one person, one of the ministers said, oh, I can't tell my congregation about your, talk to them about the, your drug awareness meeting. Some, it'd get them upset, get my, some, some of my people upset. Anybody can get addicted to methamphetamine. You don't need to have an addictive personality or whatever that is. Um, animals get addicted, and humans who take methamphetamine get addicted. Your brain will release dopamine, and dopamine is the happy drug, is a natural happy drug that we all have. That makes you feel good. That gives you lots of energy, feel optimistic, uh, reduces your appetite, allows you to stay awake much longer. And lots of people find that very attractive. I felt unstoppable. I felt like I was on top of the world. And I loved it. Oh my gosh. And oh, but it's just, it's so good, but so bad. And when I was on it, I felt like, you know, there was just ping pong balls going around in my head. And it gets so hard to, you know, winnow out a thought out of that chaos. I tell them it's, it's an actual living, breathing demon, man. This thing takes control of people and it, you know, I've had people say that it talks to them. You know, it just, it takes control of you and it it dictates your life. I can't probably count three people that I've dealt with that have actually kicked it, that have beat meth. As you administer the drug to your brain and then after you do it again and again, your brain starts to change. You start to hallucinate and you start to see things that aren't there, hear things that aren't there, and feel things on your body that are not really there. My relationship with my mom went downhill pretty fast, and I didn't want a relationship with her. It's like being possessed by the devil, and it's you're convinced that you can't go back, and that this is your way of life now. By 2006, meth was here to stay, and it was changing small towns in ways they never imagined. Some of the people in the Midwest have been complaining for years. Federal government's got to step in and do something. And then, of course, you talk to the people on the East Coast. Well, it's not an issue out here. It's a Midwest problem. Uh, but clearly, that, that has changed over the last several years where it's, uh, it's, it's made it to the East Coast. And uh, I think that got a lot of people's attention that it truly was a domestic issue. And then you look around, and you know the right thing is to stand up and say, no, this is wrong. This is not sort of wrong. This is really wrong. This is a holocaust. This is a tremendous danger. And they say, well, what can you do? And we're kind of like that here. What can you do? As opposed to, you've got to do something. It just seems so odd that places like Glenwood, conservative, church-going hamlets that kept their communities in check to almost biblical standards, could allow this obvious drug problem to go unchecked. Addicted folks increasingly exhibited strange public behavior 
and crime was going through the roof, serious crime that these towns had never seen in the past. Now who was going to step in and deal with these and other issues related to this new public scourge? We called the Red Oak Police Department, and we explained to them that we were making a, a, a documentary on methamphetamine, and the lady actually said to us, oh, we don't have a problem with that out here. Oh, well. Oh, everybody knows, yeah. Whether they want to admit it or not, everybody knows. There was hardly, hardly anybody that can't say it. At some point in time, in some form, they felt the effects of the dough. People go, why is meth a problem? Because you can make it with Sudafed. Plain and simple, and, and anhydrous ammonia. You know, that's the thing we have around here. People go out and they tap these anhydrous ammonia tanks. When we first started doing drug deals in Glenwood, I remember I bought like a quarter gram, which was $25 worth of methamphetamine at the time. And it took us like two days to get the deal done. And now we're buying quarter pounds, pounds of it, so. Wow, which indicates that there's a lot more people doing it. It took a while for the law enforcement to say, hey, this is, this is a big problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and then kind of, you know, turning the light on the cockroaches once, once they, they, they saw what it was. And by 98, 99, I mean, it was a big enough problem that, like, the FBI was in here uh, because the labs, they were making them. Mm -hmm. For instance, you could, you could get the materials to make meth and put it in the back seat of your car and make it while you were driving around. That's how easy it was. Anhydrous tanks out here on the farms, they could come out and they could get the anhydrous and get the ingredients and either make it in their bathtub or they can make it in a little tub with hoses in the backseat of their car while they're driving around. They learn how we work and they do things to counteract to make it harder for us. So it became mobile. They were cooking in their cars, uh, cooking in remote areas because we pop some houses, you know, and it, you only have to pop two or three or four. Word gets out, don't be doing this in your house because the cops can smell it from the street. But I don't care what town you go to, I don't care if it's 500 people or a small town of 5,000. There's dope in that town, guaranteed. They formulated a, uh, a task force for the Southwest Iowa, which Council Bluffs in Iowa is considered a drug hub, meaning that's where you know a lot of drugs come into that portion and they're disseminated throughout the Southwest portion of the state. I would say that there's not a street, not a block up there that doesn't have either somebody using or somebody dealing. There's a lot of community support here, um, but I think that we're so ill prepared for this epidemic. You know, if we had if we had a, if we had an alcoholic, you know, we'd we'd, we'd take care of them. People would kind of you know say, hey, Bob, you know, you need to stop drinking so much. Um, but when it happens on such such a quick pace, and you have so many addicts, the infrastructure for social, you know, cohesion was overwhelmed. We know who our local dealers are, mm -hmm. and here again, that's where federal help would come in handy is to be able to surveil them, mm -hmm. because it takes, to make a good, productive drug bust, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of surveillance, and you have to have a lot of information to get your warrant to go in and bust the place. Uh, sheriffs from around the country, 500 sheriffs, went to Washington, and, uh, and the... Uh, Head of the Drug Enforcement Agency, I believe, at that point, said that the number one drug problem in America was marijuana. The, uh, the sheriffs very quickly let him know that that was not the case, that it was uh, methamphetamine. John Walters has made a career being anti-marijuana. He had his assistant, Scott Burns, send a letter to every single prosecutor in the United States saying, this is in the middle of the meth epidemic, that your priority as a prosecutor is marijuana. The fact is, is that the, a Republican governor in South Dakota is saying 67% of my population, of my women, are in prison, and it's breaking my budget. And so uh, the, you know, the governor of Indiana, a Republican, saying, wait a minute, this is taking over our communities, and it's taking over our neighborhoods. It's not just an Indianapolis problem. In fact, it is a rural problem. And still, uh, ONDCP felt like they needed to keep focused on marijuana. In 1971, Richard Nixon declared war on the casual drug user. 
And for the next 37 years, a campaign of propaganda against marijuana became so pervasive that by the time Nancy Reagan first uttered Just Say No, nobody dared light up a joint in public. Look, Dad, it's not... Where did you get it? Dad, Answer me. Who taught you how to do this stuff? You, all right? I learned it by watching you. It created the perfect environment for more easily concealable drugs, like methamphetamine, to slide in under the radar. When the government so focuses on the millions of people that use marijuana, it shouldn't be too big of a surprise that in other areas of the culture, dangerous drug use starts to go on. When we have focused on the hardcore drug user uh, and provided treatment and given the hardcore drug user the kind of support they need and navigating them through treatment and giving a comprehensive approach, we've seen crime go down significantly. We saw that in the 90s. It was interesting, in the Reagan administration, the focus was on the casual drug user. In fact, we went from 22 million uh, individuals in this country would experiment with drugs down to 11 million. And so we decreased the casual drug user. But the hardcore drug user increased. And so you saw this increase in crime in the 80s. Well, everybody was like celebrating how wonderful it is that the casual drug user has decreased. We were seeing this increase in crime. I just think the priorities are very wrong. And it's contributed to why the methamphetamine problem has gotten as severe as it has. Marijuana is certainly an issue of concern, particularly for young people. However, we have this drug problem that has destroyed communities, and it just hasn't been addressed at all, while we've continued to put all of our resources in the prevention area into reducing uh, marijuana. People really just want to, you know, kind of hope that the problem goes away. Because we've tried to address drug problems before. I think that's the other thing that's going against uh, rural America and the meth problem is that a lot of people think of the crack problem, and they they think about Nancy Reagan getting up saying, just say no, and they go, how in the hell are we going to stop meth? Meth is more addictive than crack, and we did any success fighting crack. And so I think people just kind of go, we're not going to be able to do it. Winston Churchill said that the biggest threat we have in the world today is not the nuclear threat. It is apathy. Do you feel like you're battling a losing battle with this meth? And this Pretty problem? much. I mean, there is absolutely no way we are going to get ahead of the drugs. No way. We in the United States tend to treat all problems like a huge deal. And all, all we have to do is, put, is make it a little bit harder for people to get their hands on pseudoephedrine. Attempts to control the sale of pseudoephedrine date back to the 80s. But it wasn't until 2004 when the pharmaceutical lobby lost the battle and Congress finally enacted the Combat the Meth Epidemic Act in March of 2006. I put it together a few years ago to distribute amongst all the local uh, stores. Oh, yeah. Just to give them an idea of, you know, if any of these items are being purchased uh -huh. together, you know, each, each, each okay. one in and of itself is nothing. Because of this, purity dropped, and local agencies saw a brief lull in the epidemic. You take the pseudo away, which is a good thing. Uh -huh. You know, we don't have the labs. We're into the seventh month of the year. I don't know if I've done two labs, if we've seen two labs. I don't, well, I don't that's even... That's good, though, isn't it? It is, but now we have a new problem. When Congress finally began limiting the sale of pseudoephedrine in 2006, it was unfortunately too little too late. As the mom and pop meth labs began drying up, like desert streams in the States, a new, far more sinister specter saw its opportunity to cash in on the ignored epidemic. We traveled south to the border to search for someone with any insights into how and why this new meth was able to flow so freely into the United States. So as we reduced the domestically produced methamphetamine, it was an ideal opportunity for Mexican traffickers to step in with a cheaper product, higher impurity, 
uh, and in uh, the amounts that they can basically supply whatever the demand was. Uh, right now, we're estimating about 80% of domestic methamphetamine that's being used here domestically is produced about three miles from here south of the border. This particular corridor that comes up through the El Paso mm -hmm. corridor is crucial uh, to the Midwest and for any narcotics to be heading eastbound. But our border security in you know the south is terrible because that's where our super labs are in Mexico and the lion's share and the bulk of the drugs that are in Omaha and Council Bluffs and around here come from you know the Hispanic gangs that are bringing these drugs up and selling it by the truckload essentially and it's we have to do something about that. If we were serious about stopping you know the drug trade we would do something about that. It's an extremely uh, violent war going on for control of the corridor, which is their ability to, to bring dope across here. Uh, we're clearly dealing with the Juarez cartel, which uh, is, is right across the border here. Not last night, the night before they killed 14 people over there. Yeah, and the way they're killing them is lighting them up, uh, cutting their heads off. They're brutal over there, and the, pro the problem is uh, the local police forget it. Forget it. Don't even get near them. I mean, they're that bad. They're that corrupt. You know, years ago in Chicago, I worked on the remnants of the old Italian organized crime. Um, and many people used to consider the outfit of the, ma the mafia the most vicious, uh, calculating criminal organizations we've ever seen. They pale in comparison to what's going on in Mexico. These are the most violent, out of control criminal organizations this world's ever seen. His name was Nacho Coronel. He's known in Mexico as the Crystal King. And Ignacio Coronel was given the keys to the Mexican meth trade by a guy named El Chapo Guzman, who's El Chapo means shorty. He's a short Mexican dude. And El Chapo, the shorty, is, is the guy who is definitively, de facto, the most powerful organized criminal boss right now in Mexico. He operates what is what is what has been known as the Senior Law Federation which in turn operates on the Pacific side of Mexico. Operates in the state of Sinaloa, operates in the state of Sonora and Chihuahua up on the border, operates in the state of Michoacan farther south, operates in, uh, in, in Jalisco and some of these other states, uh, Oaxaca as well. So Shorty gives to the Crystal King the keys to the meth trade. The Crystal King says, great, I'm gonna take some money you give me. I'm gonna go make these super labs. We're gonna start pushing our new product meth in the US, because we can legally import through our pharmaceutical businesses, the pseudoephedrine. We have these super labs hidden up in these valleys. Everyone in Michoacan is paid off. No one's going to mess with us. So we're just going to start creating this stuff, pushing it north. Yeah. So the fear of having these labs discovered is non-existent. Very remote areas of Mexico, virtually lawless in terms of police presence. Uh, the traffickers control the area. And their ability to still acquire uh, ton quantities of pseudoephedrine from the Far East. Uh, we have not seen that curtailed as much as people would like to believe. Mexico, as I look at it right now, is pretty much where Colombia was 10 years ago. The role that methamphetamine plays in all of this is because it generates money. It generates a lot of money, man. Chapo Guzman was named by a U.S. magazine, a U.S. business magazine, as one of the richest guys in the world. What is being interdicted represents between a third and a fourth of what's actually moving. So what's being busted, what's being seized in terms of Mexican organized crime is the cost of doing business. I mean, I don't know, where did it come from? Who, who, I don't know. Here's, here's an eight ball, 40, 50 bucks. You know, it's gonna kill you, but I'll have 50 bucks. When Rhonda finally hit rock bottom, her only alternative was to move in with Brian and his young daughter, Jaden, down in Texas. Hello. Hello. <laughs> There's awesome. my first. Yeah. She's perfect. Aren't you? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> as good as she is, as good as everything is, she's still not independent. And I, you know, there's still, there's a lot, not a lot of closure there, I don't think, for her. Because she's dependent on me, you know, to survive. Which I, she doesn't like, you know? 
Neither one of us like. You and you hear those stories a lot more of like generations past of being self-sufficient and stubborn and I'll take care of myself and that kind of <laughs> goes back to the American dream as well. What's changed now? People say, "What can? You, why aren't you taking care of me? Right. Who's gonna do this?" I hope I can take care of myself, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, I mean, no one's taking care of Grandpa Cell. Right. Except Grandpa Cell. I don't understand that people, they would rather than go out and get a job and be meaningful people in the community, why they would turn to these kind of things. My mother always uh, continually drummed and that we were meant to do something other than take up space in this world. You know, looking back, I think I see at least for me, I didn't want that in my future. I knew I was going to college. You know, I had parents that told me about that at a young age. So I knew I had a future for me, but there were so many kids who didn't think about that. You know, they only lived in reality. They didn't talk about going to college. They didn't even talk about graduating high school. And so when they made the decision, you know, when that drug was in front of them and they made the decision to do it, they weren't thinking about, you know, things going on in the future because they didn't, you know, nobody was talking to him about those goals. It was clear that something had broken down in communities across America, where neighbors were no longer looking out for neighbors. The American family was broken down too, an entire set of values abandoned. And for what? Don't these people have any self-respect? Our society has somewhat become very difficult to live in. Um, it takes a lot of extra work to fit in. And it, um, ultimately causes folks to look for help. Alcohol, drugs, methamphetamine specifically is, is helpful in that arena. We have families who are abiding by specific societal norms. We have unwritten rules. This is how you live your life. You go to church on Sunday. You work Monday through Friday. You spend Saturday with your children. I mean, that is how you live your life. Fathers, I'll use as an example, who want to provide that type of life for their children. So they want to work extra shifts at work. And methamphetamine is actually helping them work extra hours to make more money to provide for their families and live within our societal norms. They get on this and it's like, all right, I, now that I did some, now I got to do some more because I got to stay awake another day because that kept me awake and now I got to keep awake again because I got to go to work now. It's a, you know, now it's Monday. Well, now I got to do it so I can go to work this week. I mean, if you find a meth lab in your downtown, you're going to have some extra costs associated with it. And you can't afford things like parks, you know? And so those towns are, you know, I mean, when you couple that with, you know, the farm crisis and, and you know, losing jobs in the mid, manufacturing jobs in the Midwest, you know, you just, some of these towns really do have some despair. How can a people have any self-respect? How can they have any dreams when they can't even get a decent job? Let's face it, America was founded by radicals, people who believed in the freedom of religion and the freedom of movement. And while our European counterparts had a more, shall we say, laissez-faire attitude towards labor, Americans early on made the spiritual connection between hard work and salvation. Poverty in the town in Superior, which is with 2,100 people, half the town below the poverty level. Now, we're talking about largely a rural community where folks are in economic crisis, maybe losing all that they have. Meth can be very alluring. You know, small towns have been in decline for, you know, a long time, you know, since the 1960s, basically. And if you look at the history that actually happens in these communities, you'll see this more often than you'll see it in the city. Now, where we used to have 80-acre farms, there are probably uh, maybe seven or 800 acres. So consequently, you had a lo lot less farmers now than you did back in those days. And then they don't milk cows, they don't raise chicken, they don't raise anything they eat. By the 1960s, farming had become an exercise in political maneuvering, with government controlling output. Soon the small farms were being snapped up by corporate giants, sending once proud farming families into the towns to look for whatever work they could find. Farm population now, the average age of the farmer I think is something like uh, 
oh, 50 some years old. Farmers have had some bad years. We had a few droughts between my time and now. And in the 80s, that was a bad situation. The interest rates were 18 percent. And, and then we had a packing house here. It was built in 1947, I think. And some of them came there to work. And it was in the 80s, I think, when it finally closed. The 1990s saw the advent of the North American Free Trade Agreement and later new deals with China, which effectively sent millions of manufacturer-related jobs overseas and rendered the once proud statement made in America into the standing joke of manufacturing capitals all over the world. To add insult to injury, many of the mom and pop shops increasingly found themselves forced out of business by the big box stores that began popping up outside of town. By the 2000s, the countryside had become littered with the decaying evidence of a bygone boon in this country, significant of a time when to betray a man's trust was the sign of a character flaw, a character trait that by the millennium had become quite commonplace in American corporate policies, even expected. Then you had a lot of empty buildings out on the farm. Some of them they never tore down, some of them are still standing out there. And that's a good uh, place for our people that uh, like to make mess, because a lot of times the farmer won't go back to those, that particular farm for a week or so, so. Is this an economic situation? I mean, are these people doing this to make ends meet? Well, they're doing it because uh, the, a legitimate job is minimum wage. So with a minimum wage job, you can only get about 20 hours a week because they won't give you more than 20 hours a week because then they'd have to pay you benefits and so forth. One evening of cooking up uh, however many batches of meth you have to cook up, uh, you could, will last you, uh, you can make enough money off of that to last you two or three months. It's almost impossible now for a, for a young person to start farming because the input is so high in machinery and, and uh, land prices, and that's impossible to, for a producer to realize that much value per year, you know. So what, we probably will see a lot of corporate farming in the next few years. So what started as a crack in American labor ethics quickly grew into a gaping crevasse, separating further the blue collars from the white collars and creating a new white poverty class forced to scratch out an existence by taking on sometimes multiple low-paying jobs, jobs that offered no benefits and no promise for the future. I don't want to be up for two days. I don't want to, I want to be normal, whatever normal is. I want to just have a life. I want to go to work, come home, go to bed, whatever. Rhonda has been fighting her addiction for nearly a year at Brian's house. And for the first time, she seems to be winning. Yeah. <laughs> Let's find out. That's a beautiful. Yep, it's they're drinking the water. How? It's beautiful through their stem. Now it's going not to the strawberries. Tell tell them what a caterpillar turns in. How how does a caterpillar turn into something? A butterfly. Why? What's it called? Mopsis. <laughs> you don't realize how far gone you are until you come back, you know? And I wasn't like I was a kid experimenting with anything. I was an adult. I'd been an adult for a long time, but I miss my place. You know, I just miss a lot, but, you know, there's new things. Someone will say, oh, you've made my day. You know, oh, you just, you walk in the room and you light it up. I hadn't heard those things for years, and when I started hearing them again, it's like, I'm coming back. When Barack Obama was elected president in November of 2008, a wave of hopefulness swept the nation like a hurricane. Riding the wave, we decided to return to Washington to see if there was any substance to this new hope for change. Our first stop was going to be the Office of National Drug Control Policy, where former drug czar John Walters had recently been replaced by a man named Gil Kurlowski. Um, I don't think they have an appointment. 
No, no. Or no. cold calling. Surprisingly, they responded and sent us to yeah. McGruff the crime yeah. dog. Well, I think we're seeing uh, what, in my judgment, a comprehensive approach. And what I'm hopeful over the next few years is that this isn't just going to be an enforcement response, but that we are going to put more resources into treatment. We know that treatment works for methamphetamine. And there, you know, it's interesting, we first started our summits, there was a sort of urban myth that was circulated and is actually circulated by enforcement. Treatment doesn't work with methamphetamine. You're instantly addicted and you're, you're, you can't ever uh, recover from it. And uh, that was an, uh, a myth that kind of is stifled our ability to look at this in a very clinical way or in a systematic way. Fortunately, a number of researchers punched through that and said, no, it's not true. And so we now have a much more informed approach to methamphetamine. What I'm encouraged about in the transition, both in not only Kierlikowski, but also in Kathleen Sebelius at Health and Human Services, you have leaders who understand the importance of addiction and understand addiction as a chronic relapsing disease and that we should treat it as such. It's like the old ad said, uh, pay me now or pay me later. And we're doing way too much pay, pay you later, uh, where we're waiting until uh, something is, is so destructive and somebody's so far gone that to rehabilitate them is gonna take uh, maybe as long as two years. And, and, and frankly, there's a very high percentage who really are never rehabilitated, they die before they're ever uh, able to shake the habit. So uh, we, we just feel that people need to be more proactive and uh, at the legislative level and also at the community level. In our community, in Alexandria, it cost $100,000 a year to incarcerate a kid, whereas it cost us $15,000 to educate them. Right. I'm eventually gonna have to pay for that problem down the line. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna eventually have to deal with this issue uh, as a taxpayer or as a citizen. I, I don't think that we can honestly say that we're gonna win this by calling it a war on drugs. Uh, this needs to be a, a program or a system that relates to human behavior, that understands the whys. Why would they do this? Why would they continue to do this? And why would someone wanna start doing this? Once we understand why, then maybe we can go to the heart of the problem and start fixing the problem. Because quite honestly, the problem is not methamphetamine. The problem lies beneath that. What are these folks missing in their lives that they are getting from methamphetamine? And how can we as a community fill those needs before they need to reduce themselves to using meth? From what I can tell, it's it's getting better. Um, I've I've you know a lot of these people who who have sad stories. I've seen them kind of kind of come back somewhat. Um, there's been a lot more emphasis on rehab um, lately, so there's some there's some effect. I think it's getting better, um, but I don't think it's going away at all, at all ever. I mean, it'll it'll always be part of small town America. I'm very confident that uh, the strategies that we're going to be looking at are designed to restore the individual to the community, not to segregate them or isolate them from the community. I mean, I, I, I remember crying every day for like a year, well, probably longer than that. You know, when that stopped, I realized it. It's like, wow, I didn't cry today. Rhonda has now been clean for two years. And in 2010, she moved back to Glenwood, Iowa. She came up on Mother's Day and, um, and we all went to church. And the sermon was about, you know, not only moms now, but, you know, moms of the past and people that, you know, didn't have moms. And I don't know, I don't think there was a dry eye in the entire church, but, you know, I think that, that hit me really hard because it made me realize how thankful I am to have my mom. You know, she lost her mom at a very young age. And, you know, after Mother's Day, I just turned and I hugged her and I just hugged her so tight and we both cried and I was like, I love you so much and I'm so glad you're here. And I even said to her, I'm so sorry, you don't have your mom. And it was just a really pivotal moment for me that made me realize I'm so thankful I have my mom.